Good afternoon uh, or good morning, everyone, and welcome to another FinTech Nexus webinar. My name is Peter Renton. I'm chairman and co-founder of FinTech Nexus, and it's my pleasure to uh, be leading the conversation today. We have a fascinating discussion on TAP, how banks are approaching innovative consumer lending in 2024. We've got some of the market leaders here to discuss that. We're going to be going doing a deep dive into some of the, the top sort of innovations of the, of the day right now and what we can expect going forward. Um, so if you do, uh, if, if you have some questions for our audience, we're going to get to, for our panelists, we're going to get to questions uh, later on. And uh, with that, let's just kick it off straight into some introductions. So Carol, why don't you go first? Thank you. I'm the Chief Product Officer at Provenir. We offer as a company AI-powered decisioning technology that serves the end-to-end -end customer lifecycle. And we work with organizations across the world to manage their risk and help them enable growth through smart decisioning. Um, my role as CPO, I'm responsible for the company strategy, trying to drive how we take our tech out to market in a way that adds value for specific business challenges. I've worked a little bit bank side, mostly vendor side for 20 years with a constant theme of how to use data and analytics for great business decisions um, whilst balancing potential risk with potential opportunity. Okay, Joshua. Mm. Joshua Ladd, I head up unsecured personal loans and um, interim head of cards here at Zopa Bank. Uh, so Zopa, historically, we've uh, very much focused just on the lending side. Um, we've been in the unsecured personal loans business for uh, nigh on 20 years now. Uh, more recently, we've started to flesh out the full digital bank. So um, we've bought auto finance. Um, we bought out credit cards. We recently purchased Divide Buy, Buy Now, Pay Later company and uh, savings products. And obviously we're looking to the future of kind of like, how do we fully flesh that out with the likes of current accounts, et cetera. So a full digital bank. Okay, Rahul. Um, thank you, Peter. Hi everyone, I am Rahul Duseja. Um, I am the director of credit at Cash Plus Bank. Uh, Cash Plus Bank prior to being a bank, right, was just Cash Plus. Uh, been there for almost 15 years now and predominantly serving the underserved of the market. And when I say underserved, I mean both small businesses um, and consumers, right? Again, the underserved segment of the society. Um, the institution actually became a bank, right, in 2021, right? So we are now roughly three years into banking with a specific focus on SME banking. And when I say SME banking, we really focus on the small of the SME, which are, you know, micro enterprises, right? Sole traders, self-employed um, customers. Um, on, the prop on the service proposition, right? We offer uh, current accounts, right? Both business current accounts and personal current accounts. And then unsecured lending um, in the form of overdrafts and credit cards to again, you know, to both consumers and small businesses alike. Um, I've been with Cash Plus now for almost five years, uh, but prior to that, uh, I mean, I've been in the finance industry for almost um, almost 15 years, all in unsecured lending, but ranging from um, small customers, you know, so consumers to small businesses to large corporates. Okay, thank you, everybody. And also I wanna say a thank you to uh, Provenir for sponsoring this webinar and making it possible. So with that, let's get right into it. Um, I wanna talk about um, borrowers first. And when, when maybe uh, Josh, I'll start with you. When you're talking to borrowers today, what is what is top of mind for them right now? I think we've got two groups of borrowers at the moment, um, as I think people have heard kind of in the mainstream media. So we've got one set who are very definitely being impacted by the cost of living crisis. Um, they're a bit more focused on the here and now, kind of how are they um, staying on top of payments, et cetera. We then have a second group of borrowers who have been less impacted by a uh, cost of living crisis and are a bit more focused on making sure that they're getting the best value out of kind of the financial products that they have and the best experiences. So if we, if we start to drill into those, so I think the first group, I mean, Wider market data has shown this. So FICO data suggests that credit card 
accounts missing two payments was up about 25% year on year in 2023. Um, I think there, there are positive signs now. I would say that um, most lenders are starting to see more of the kind of end of that. And we're hoping that by the end of, say, 2024, I don't think we'll be perfect, but we'll be in a much better spot than we are at the moment. So um, the, there are other signs as well in terms of things like people paying the minimum payment rather than um, paying the full payment on their credit card and various things like that that aren't quite as evident. Um, I think the latter group, they're focused far more on shopping around and trying to work out can they be getting a better deal elsewhere? So I think the savings rates increasing was a big driver of kind of customers suddenly realizing, actually, maybe I should shop around more. They started doing it with their savings rates, and now we're starting to see it a bit more with their lending products as well. So this is really exciting, certainly for us, I imagine for Cash Plus as well, in terms of um, people are getting a bit more sick and tired of their incumbents and they're starting to go out into that open market. They're getting a better product. They're getting lower pricing, much better experiences. And overall, it, it, it's just great. And so great for, that's great how for, I see the market. Yes, great for innovative uh, banks like uh, Zopa and Cash Plus. So Rahul, what, what's top of mind for the borrowers that you're talking with? I think from a consumer perspective, you know, it's what it's not different to, to what Josh already said, right? In terms of you know the cost of living crisis definitely playing on in most of the customers' minds, especially in one of the segments where where disposable income actually becomes tighter. Um, but we do see uh, you know a kind of let's say some hope at the end of the tunnel, right? So you know with with inflation rate essentially you know kind of sticking at four percent, expected to go down, um, disposable income you know expected to increase in April through increase in minimum wages, another two p cut in the national insurance and so on and so forth. At least the situation is likely to be better, right, for that segment as well going forward. That said, I think I'd probably add an element for it, right, in terms of the small businesses that we're, you know, where we operate um, in, right? And, you know, again, you know, these are micro enterprises, right? Typically behave like consumers, right? You know, self, self-employed self people and so on and so forth. I think what, what everybody is beginning to realize is, you know, that that the days for low interest rate environment are all gone, right? At least, you know, uh, it's not going to go back to the same levels, you know, pre, let's say, pre the crisis, right, era. So it's going to be, they're good, there's going to be a new normal. We're already seeing the impact of that in increased insolvencies, right, business insolvencies in 2022, 2023. So sustainability is key for, for those businesses, right, for all our businesses, right, similar for consumers, right, I mean, kind of floating through their through their day-to-day, -day, you know, life, right, is, is becomes important, right, in that sense. Um, so for us, it's, it's kind of, you know, delivering back more value to the customer. And, you know, it kind of ties back to what Josh was saying, that they're looking for more value, more choices, right? So, you know, for example, um, you know, and it's very common right nowadays, right? But when we started back in back in 2022 with our business credit card, right, testing, um, we kind of launched a 1% cash back. You know, that that is a solid value proposition, which most banks actually now do, right, for, for some of the business credit card propositions out there. But that's what the customers are looking for in terms of saying, you know, how do I sustain my business? How do I, you know, navigate this new normal, interest rate normal for me? Um, and then how do I get the best value out of the banking service that I really choose? Got it, got it. Okay. Um, so let's move to you, Carol. And I, I'd love to kind of get sort of a your perspective on, you know, when you're talking to your lending clients, both in the UK and in Europe, what are, what are you hearing as sort of the biggest issues for them right now? Sure, I, I think there are varying issues um, that, that are evolving. I think the first one is regulation based. So especially in the UK with the, um, the 2023 regulation around consumer duty, it's about how to try and keep up with those standards. Um, they themselves actually are um, forcing people to do things that actually I think will positively impact the way that they run their businesses um, around transparency, understanding their data uh, and their customers better and engaging in particular ways. So the regulation isn't all bad, but trying to keep up is quite a big theme um, and, and a challenge for those that we speak with. Um, across Europe, I think, and, and generally actually we see everywhere in the world, um, 
still you have players disrupting the industry and you know new market entrants especially on the embedded finance piece can come from from all sorts of corners um so it's trying to stay ahead and differentiate um when the products offered are quite similar how else can you differentiate well perhaps through the experience the interaction um the type of access that said if you think your experience is is superior and very attractive how can you sort of innovate in the products so so that piece around sort of staying competitive um, and I think there are a couple more. One is around um, the inclusive finance. So we're hearing about sort of those who are perhaps underserved in some some markets. Again, that's that's something that we see organisations really wanting to um, solve that challenge of how to offer lending to the underbanked in a in a controlled way um, and not assume that um, that services shouldn't be provided, but how to do that in a in a way that is is sort of under control for that organization and mitigates that risk and of course takes um, the best of the opportunity. Um, and then the final one really is thinking about uh, the different demographics who are seeking uh, products in today's modern digital world and you know with for a new generation that is looking for lending um it's how to you know consider the topic of net zero banking so how to position modern lending to to that sort of um evolving newer generation demographic um, not that they're the only ones that care about it, of course, but they do seek as a particular demographic information and, and sort of um, uh, want to be aware of, of that topic as well. So those are some challenges of slightly varying uh, themes. Mm -hmm. OK, OK, so let's move into opportunities and uh, maybe I'll go back to you, Josh, and uh, just talk about the you know, what are the growth opportunities that you're seeing at, at Zopa as you look to this year and beyond? Oh, so I think if we rewind a few years, my answer to this would largely be um, the incumbents are useless, they're not very <laughs> transparent, and therefore it was easy to grow because uh, we could just pluck customers away from them. Um, I think it's quite positive to say that the incumbents have got a lot better. The transparency is increasing. We are seeing a better use of digital there, certainly on the acquisition side with kind of pre-approvals, real rates, et cetera. So um, given that they're keeping up with us now, it's obviously harder for us to grow which is good because it gives me something to think about. Um, <laughs> so the areas that we're focusing on, I think there are two key ones. First one is new data sources. And how do we really use those new data sources? Obviously, machine learning is a big part of how we do that, which we'll uh, potentially go on to a little later. I think then the other side is kind of compelling customer propositions um, and really thinking about what, what are the issues that the customers are having um, and how do we fix them? So instead of saying, well, here's a credit card, here's a loan, it's more somebody needs money for X. How do we kind of get rid of these um, definitions that we've had before of um, certain products and how do we merge that together and say, well, you want X, how do we get you X and how do we do that at a fair price? So it's this blending of the or blurring of the lines between all of the different products and that's one of the areas that we're really interested in at the moment is fine, we've got a credit card alone, a BMPL, but how do you start to blur those together? Mm -hmm. Interesting. That is a, that's a, that is an interesting way of framing it. So Rahul, what's, um, what, where are you seeing the biggest growth opportunities right now? I think, I think you know, there, are, there are two aspects, right, of the growth. And I think one aspect, right, Josh already touched upon, right, in terms of saying, you know, what are, what are the key things that you know a company or a bank can do, right, in terms of making some of the offers, right, personalized for their customers, right? So, you know, long gone are the days, right, where you know it's 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 a broad brush approach, right, in the sense that here is a product, and you know whether you take it or leave it is kind of you know what what the what the value prop was, right? Now customers are are more demanding, right, in that sense, and rightly so, right, because you know they have a lot of choices, right, from a distribution perspective. Um, so it all comes down to saying, you know, can I be um, a provider of finance at the right time, you know, at the right, you know, right point where the customer actually needs that finance, which comes along, you know, with with a lot of data analysis. And, you know, we'll, we'll surely touch upon AI later on, as Josh was also mentioning about, right, in terms of, you know, how do we make that a reality in terms of saying, you know, this is an offer which is specifically suited to a particular customer's needs. And it is at a, coming in at a time when they need it the most. 
is what drives growth, right, in, in the market. So that's definitely one aspect. I think the second aspect is not hidden at all, right? It's probably you know, all, over the, all over the press, right? Everybody is talking about it, which is, which is the buy now, pay later uh, phenomenon, right? In that sense, I mean, we've seen huge growth in that segment and we are expected to see huge growth in that segment up until 2028. Um, so it's, you know, it's a large market. Again, you know, uh, smaller ticket sizes, right? Different set of requirements, right? I mean, it's not, it's not kind of driven by the traditional need of credit, right? It's more like a budgeting tool, more so important at the time of cost of living crisis and so on and so forth. So I think that's another segment, right? Which is, you know, which is definitely going to offer a lot of growth, not just in consumers, right? I see it the same way for business lending as well. Again, you know, remember small, small businesses are like customers, right? Where they're looking, for example, trade credit, right? It's, it is buy now, pay later, right? In that sense, that is the traditional name of it. But people are kind of, you know, realizing to the fact that there is a product out there, you know, that can serve um, them in the time of their credit need is not conventional credit and actually works works well for them. So a lot of opportunity I see there as well. Right, right. Well, we're going to dig into BNPL in just a minute, but before we do, Carol, I want I want to turn to you and um, get your perspective. Sort of when you're talking with your lending customers today, what are some of the themes that they, they are hitting on when it comes to growth opportunities? Sure. So I touched earlier on the, um, I guess, the two lenses of trying to innovate and 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 stand out and be great at either sort of the products and the flexibility and the variety, or in fact how you're engaging with the customers, which we've talked about, and how that's personalised and and at the right moment. I think that's such an important point that's made um, because timing is is absolutely key. Um, I think there are perhaps two other things to consider. Um, where we're working with organisations, we've seen such a shift over the last few years as to how people actually consider and build their business around risk management. You know, if we look back 10, 20 years, the idea of risk was sort of, it was very black and white and it was very negative and it was about reducing losses um, and similar to fraud. We're talking sort of credit risk or fraud risk. Um, but in fact, actually, if you think of risk and getting risk right and, and managing risk to a level that you're comfortable with as an organisation, it, it can actually be a growth enabler. And, and so it's sort of around shifting the mindset on that to make the most of the sort of risk processes and how you treat it. Because if you are really understanding your risk well, that means you really understand who you're interacting with as a customer or potential customer in the moment, which means you can then serve them in an absolutely appropriate way. You can help them sort of fly through various processes and systems or interrupt them and disrupt them. So it's about trying to actually see how risk management can be a growth enabler in the business. Um, and I think the second theme that we want, we're seeing people want to do is look at the I mean, this isn't a new thing, but it continues to be really prevalent and in discussions around the holistic customer life cycle. So rather than them the being sort of separate systems, separate processes, separate teams, considering that onboarding piece and then that customer management, even if it is separate teams, separate systems, separate processes, how can you make the most holistically, um, uh, especially in the sort of um, more disruptive parts of the financial service industry? How can you make the most of sharing either intel, seeing what's good, seeing what's um, predictive to be you know, um, most valuable for you as a business to then serve customers in the right way and actually sort of just breaking down that silo from sort of front, uh, front end and then throughout the customer life cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So I want to, I want to dig into BNPL for a few minutes here and um, Josh, go back to you. Uh, you know, Zope is interesting because you, you obviously you started in personal loans, as you said, you, you have credit, you have credit card now and you acquired uh, divide by BNPL provider um, fairly recently. So when you're looking at BNPL, how do you, how are you thinking about it? Um, as it fits in with with your other the other products that you offer, yeah. So we we purchased Divide by back in Feb twenty twenty three. So we're about a year in or so now, and uh, it's very much part of our journey to try and uh, help bring the kind of well, basically the the kind of the regulation, the customer protections and the sustainability to that market, because there have been pockets that have been uh, subpar, we'll say, on some of those um, on some of those metrics. Um, for us, I think it fits in really perfectly. So you get the 
you can get some of the lending amounts that you get in personal loans. So up to sort of £25,000 on our um, on our BNPL uh, products. But at the same time, you get the customer protections if anything goes wrong. So some of the benefits of the credit card. So it can gel in really nicely in between the two of some of the lending amounts for loan, but some of the customer protections for credit card coming through. I think as we as we look to the future, what we're going to be doing is working out how can we make this more of a part of how um, the customer sees OPA. So at the moment, I'll concede from our point of view, we do have a loan product, we have a credit card product, and then under the Divide By brand, we have a BNPL product. And what we're trying to work out to my previous point is how do we blur those lines in between them? So I know that um, you've got the likes of Monzo Flex out there where they've really very much blurred the lines of kind of installment loans on a card-based product. Um, are, is that something that we should be doing? Are there other kind of merchant orientated products that we can build that might be buy now, pay later, or they might be card based? Like, how will it work? And that's very much us talking to merchants, talking to customers, understanding what their needs are, and how could we best um, solve them. So Drawing it back, I think for me, it's very much, uh, it complements our current business, but there's so much more that we could be doing here. And that's what we're really investing in at the moment, working out where do we go with all of that. Right, right. Yeah, I guess it's still early days in, in many ways for you guys. So, um, Raul, I think uh, maybe you could describe your approach to BNPL because you have a pretty innovative product in the market that has a lot of the features of, yeah. of BNPL. Maybe you could uh, sort of describe that and how how that fits in with the rest of your lending business. Sure. Um, I think I'll probably start with Josh's statement, right, in terms of blurring the lines, right, between between products. And I think that is that is what we have done, right, really, with one single product. I mean, I, I for personally, you know, have been a believer of saying, you know, that a customer shouldn't be fixated with saying, you know, I need money for something. So there is a specific product that will meet a specific need. And that's the end of story, right? So it makes it more transactional in that sense, right? So if I need to buy something big, I need to now go and, you know, apply for a loan, pay off the loan. If I need to, you know, something on the credit, then here's a credit card, an overdraft, and so on and so forth, right? So it, it makes it, you know, really confusing for the customer, right? In that sense saying, okay, I mean, if I'm good for X thousand, right, whatever that amount is, right? I mean, why can't I use the amount the way I want to and repay it the way I want to? Which is where I thought, you know, is, is key for, for businesses especially, right? I mean, they need that flexibility in financing and so do consumers now, to be honest, right? But our approach, right, more so was on the business side. So what we did was we said, you know, here is a line, in a, and here is a credit line, I mean, right? So here is a credit line. And, you know, whatever that credit line is, this is what you're good for. And you can really spend that credit line through whatever mechanism you'd want to, right? So, you know, for example, if you'd want to buy a large purchase, right? So, you know, let's say, you know, invest in plant, machinery, equipment, whatever it is, but then you don't want to really revolve it. You'd want to pay it back in an installment loan fashion, then you can do it. If, you know, if you think that's more like a BNPL arrangement that you'd want to have, which is saying, you know, I pay you after three months without any interest being charged, then yes, you can do that with the product, right? And if you think, you know, you simply want to do part of it as revolving credit cards, you know, you'd want to do something, uh, you know, partly on the credit card side, but partly on the loan side and partly on the NPL side, you can do that as well. So, you know, it's it's a combination of saying, you know, whatever you, you buy, you don't have to choose at the moment of buying saying how you want to repay or how you want to buy. And there's one mechanism to buy and there's, you know, there's multiple mechanisms to repay, right? And you can choose that via the app itself in terms of how you'd want to repay um, for that customer. So I think I think for us, that was that was the biggest moment, right? In the sense that that flexibility needs to be there for the customer to be able to use the line either via card, either, you know, making a payment to someone using online banking and then repay it equally flexibly uh, saying I'd, I'd pay it like a BNPL or pay it like an installment loan, does not matter, right? So we have that proposition you know, which is which is throughout for our business credit card customer at the moment. So then, can you just, I just want to clarify then, if you start off um, saying you, like you decide, okay, I think I want to do this as a BNPL, and then you make a maybe one payment or even two payments, can you then change your mind and say, 
you want to now make the rest of this an installment loan? You can. Okay. So essentially, you know, it 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 doesn't kind of bind you into anything, right? So you know, which is what the whole idea of saying, you know, completely get away with the rigidity, right, of the whole structure of you know of of a line, right, of a credit line or a credit product, right? Saying, you know, be flexible about it, right? If you want to repay early, go for it. If you want to, you know, kind of let's say you repaid in a credit card style, right, or on an installment loan, but then you realize actually, you know what, might be better to get me on to a BNPL side and then repay it that way. So you get off that feature and get on to another feature, which can help you repay in a different style if you'd like to. So all kinds of flexibility possible for the customers in that. That's really interesting, really interesting. Okay, um, Carol, I want to turn to you. I mean, I know you've been working with BNPL providers for many years. Um, can you just maybe, when you look at the, at the at that sort of niche in the market, what are their needs now and how, how are their needs have changed over time? Sure. Um, well, it was yeah, really interesting point that um, Raul just mentioned. I think we'll I'll come back to that in a second, actually. But I think in general, there has been um, such great enthusiasm um, and rapid growth for this sort of product, um, of course. Um, I don't think that booms over, as we've heard. You know, the stats really support that, that, that it will continue to grow. But it's definitely in this maturing phase and everyone's trying to work out, you know, how, how to sort of settle some things, how to sort of continue building on others. So where we've been working with those sorts of organisations, we've seen that their focus has been just that less on that rapid growth and, and acquisition of customers, uh, still obviously wanting to do that, but not as the only focused and sole focus, but now looking at those existing customers and shifting the focus towards enabling those relationships to be sustainable um, and aiming for you know sustainable profit uh, as as a as a business um so they're looking at you know how they're engaging with customers and 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 back to the point we just heard around um how there's flexibility in the products to offer something that can you know just fit the customer and not change really the risk for the organization but but make the most opportunity to deliver the value to the customer through that flexibility so that's what we're seeing them focused more on their existing customer book now um, rather than just acquire 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 um without consequence and um, which is obviously unfair on, on many who didn't quite do like that but but obviously there was that rapid boom um, and then the only other thing to mention is of course some are now looking at product expansion so where by now pay later as a product was potentially what they offered and how they came to market it's about sort of yeah expanding not just flexibility within the product but but moving to other areas as well so all, all sorts mm -hmm. interesting interesting so um just, just a question for the audience if you do have um a question for our panelists hit the q a button um we will get we're going to get to those towards the end of end of the session here but now we want to switch to the talking about ai and uh josh going back to you i mean i remember talking with uh some of your colleagues, you know, eight, nine, ten years ago, um, where you were talking about using AI in your underwriting. So you've got a lot of history, it seems like, there when it comes to, you know, underwriting using AI for personal loans. What, um, you know, where are you innovating around AI today, you know, beyond underwriting? Yeah, so uh, you're very right. It was uh, 2015 that we launched our first AI model uh, for credit underwriting. It was, um, uh, yeah, it was using a couple of different methods um, back then. Anyway, um, it's fair to say that we're now using AI a hell of a lot more than we were doing then. So um, certainly the main use case is very much in credit underwriting right now. So we do fully pre-approved uh, guaranteed rate um, and guarantee credit limit in uh, relation to credit card decisions within, it's about 99% or so within about five seconds at the moment, all of wow. which are based on a variety of different AI models, depending on which product. Um, so it's an area that we've invested a huge amount in. I think as, so as we look to the future, I think there are a couple of areas. So one that I touched on earlier and we'll come back to is, um, new data sources. So open banking, we've not really talked a huge amount about it so far, but that's an area where I would like to say we're finally getting some solid momentum in the industry. I think there's been a little bit of a chicken and egg situation where lenders have wanted to get the data, but 
getting that data is quite hard because we tend to all be well a lot of how we sell is through aggregators where we don't have the applicant relationship anyway it's great to see that some of the aggregator partners that we work with in consumer finance are gathering that data sending it through to us so open banking is a big area that we're looking at um, both in feature engineering as well as the features that we build using them within our risk models etc i think then separately so we've just hired a senior director of generative AI, so Didier Backlin, um, which I believe is a first for the industry at that kind of level of seniority. So his remit is very much how can we use Gen, Gen AI across the rest of Zopa. So I think there are going to be a few different ways. For example, on my laptop here, we have Copilot, etc., all enabled throughout the office suite. We've got various other um, things in the kind of background as to how we're starting to use it and really lean in to Gen AI. I think some of the obvious ones are chatbots and how you interact with customers. I think there's going to be a big area around um, kind of categorizing and data mining a lot of unstructured data. So things like complaints that come in, things like agent notes, et cetera, really understanding what is going on in our operation and how can we improve all of that. Um, and then also starting to use it to take some of the burden off our software engineers as well. So um, a lot of time is spent by engineers putting together kind of cookie cutter code, if you will. Um, we're starting to really lean into how can we get Gen AI to get rid of the boring side of life so that they're focusing on that 5% where they really add value. So there are all sorts of different areas that we're looking at, um, and I'm sure that there'll be more that we go after in the near future as well with Didier now on board. Right, right. So are, th is this, are these sort of like 2024 um, projects or are, this, are you looking at much further out? I think we've got a mix of many of them. So they're very much, uh, I think some of the more obvious use cases in terms of data mining, our own data, et cetera, very much 2024, um, helping engineers out, et cetera. I think as we, as we start to look at, can we use AI to provide insights to customers based on all of their financial data? I think there'll be some testing and some little bits in 24, but it's probably a longer term. How do we really refine this and, and get some really excellent insights out of it um, to put in front of our customers and really hopefully transform their financial lives? Yeah, super interesting times to be uh, to be a lender. Like there's there's so much that that can be done and is going to be done in this space. So then, Rahul, what about uh, what about a cash plus? Um, how are you how are you thinking about AI today? I think I'll, I'll probably take a step back. Right, I mean it's really really interesting. Right, in terms of you know especially the generative AI piece. Right, and and the applicability of it. Right, more so in the financial industry. Right, in that sense. Um, so we are not, you know, we are not into generative AI at the moment, right? But there's this always this thought in mind, right? Saying, you know, how do we, how do we kind of, you know, use that to the best potential, right? In terms of getting the customers right things and so on and so forth. But in general, right? I mean, AI is, of course, you know, the recent buzzword, right? AI has been there for quite some time, right? So you know, if you if you think about machine learning, right? Machine learning being a subset of AI, those models have been around for that for quite some time, and we've been using those models, right? In that sense. Um, so for us, right, I think it's a stepped approach, right, in the sense that we started with, you know, machine learning models and now, you know, kind of some of more, let's say, AI specific models, right, um, which we are more geared towards, you know, the, the economic crime, fraud, right, those kinds of decisionings, right. So I think that's where, that's where it kind of plays a critical role, right, in identifying and able to kind of accurately identify, you know, um, which kind of customers or accounts, right, are potentially fraudulent or potentially, you know, can... Um, can, you know, kind of uh, are, are opening up for AML reasons or money laundering reasons, not AML reasons, but money laundering reasons, right? Um, so our applicability for the models, right, at least the ones which are the advanced models, right, are on those use cases. In terms of credit, right, I think I think it's it's a balance at this point in time for us, right, to be able to kind of, you know, say which models are, um, which models, you know, can actually explain to the customer in terms of why they, you know, why they were declined, right? So we still have to kind of make sure that there's explainability in the current models that we use for decisioning and, you know, how we, you know, how and why we decline those customers on those models. And I think there's, 
there's a bit of you know a journey in there for both banks like ourselves and also the regulators right i mean if you if you talk to regulators about ai right i mean they have their own journey right in that sense right so it kind of you know is kind of saying how do we make sure that that, that journey is aligned right between the regulators and the banks to be able to use the full extent of ai across different you know um, different use cases i think i agree with josh in in one point definitely is that you know there are wider use cases than credit so you know one example right which we probably all read in the news right a few i think was it a few weeks back right about klarna actually using a lot of ai for their customer services right i th- i think great use case right frankly right outside of credit but but absolutely you know, to, you, know, you know tremendous use of ai in those areas especially you know if it helps customers solve their problems quickly nothing better than that right right and and then i think that it was Klarna, I think they said they were saving 700 jobs or something with their AI technology there. So that was yeah. was really interesting. Um, so, Carol, I know you guys at Provenir have you know some AI-powered risk decisioning tools. Maybe you can talk about um, how the lenders you're working with are, are using AI tools, not just for the initial credit decision, but maybe across the whole borrower life cycle. Sure. Um and this, I mean, this is such a big topic. I feel like we could have the whole day. <laughs> okay, the next half hour we're just talking about this, but we're not going to. <laughs> yeah, yeah just on this topic. So uh, let's make it brief. So I guess throughout that life cycle beyond onboarding, there are many different types of decisions you might want to make um, when you're either reacting to a customer wanting to do something a bit differently or, or get something else, or you as an organization are proactively trying to then engage with them in some way or mitigate something happening. Um, and so, yes, AI is definitely made, um, can make those decisions much better in a few ways. So making them more accurate um, with the machine learning that's been reference you know trying to learn from the outcomes before um but but i guess more these days it's around not just the machine learning piece but also trying to from that customer centric type mentality make those decisions more more suitable and appropriate for the end consumer based on smarter segmentation and and these sort of personalized strategies we've touched on before to just to engage successfully have a high likelihood of a, a positive outcome um, AI can also make the um, these decisions and the processes much more efficient. Um, and this isn't just about um, sort of adding a model in. This is around really embedding um, ways to um, have sort of proactive recommendations from systems to to improve things like data usage. We see customers that want to call. Um, sorry, we see organizations that want to call extra third party data as part of a decision beyond onboarding but it gets expensive you know to keep calling bureau data to keep calling lots of different types of data but you can use ai to work out how to do that efficiently and optimize what data is called um as an example um and and sort of how to do that in the right moment in the right way and the final thing i think for that customer management um piece is around how ai is enabling you these days and this is what customers really um, like to work with us on um, around simulation and and the intelligence piece so okay lots of decisions are being made all the time but firstly how can you sort of step back and learn and observe of, of everything that's going on in that portfolio what's in te- what intelligence can you get from these processes and obviously AI can help you digest that um, but also how can you um, simulate things um, for recommendations as to how to improve things without pressing go <laughs> without the test uh, so yes I guess simulation is a big theme at the moment um, with the, with our customers wanting to yeah play around and, and hypothesize to be continually evolving and making things better right right so I want to just dig into that data usage piece you talked about I mean Josh mentioned it earlier with all the different you know data sources and alternative data with open banking kind of bringing so much rich data into you know potentially into kind of your your system but you know you you then have to use the data you have to process it you have to understand it what are you what is what are you doing to help lenders kind of with this sort of unstructured open banking type data maybe in the UK and in Europe how are you how are you helping them with you know with the intelligent application of that data Sure. Well, the first thing to note is that you need different data for different types of decisions. 
there's a wealth of data out there, but it's not one size fits all. It can be overwhelming for some organizations we work with, um, but there's duplication. It, it's reasonably you'd be easy to navigate if you sort of stick to themes. Um, but the way to use the data intelligently is to bear in mind that you can't call everything for everyone. You know, that gets expensive. So it's how to do it in a more in a, in a smarter way that's a bit more dynamic and actually quickly orchestrates the right data for that decision. Um, so that's one piece, how to sort of keep the, the whole um, approach dynamic and get it right um, for that particular decision, for that particular type of customer. Um, and there are obviously sort of ways to do that well um, and poorly because it has to be fast as well. Remember, we, we don't have... Uh, we don't wait long as consumers to, to have these decisions made about us. Um, and then secondly, I guess what um, what we do to help customers is help them clearly adopt those sorts of approaches, but in a way that they can still then change that in the future, because based on whatever happens to their business strategies or markets or customers, they will their needs will evolve. So to have the ability to swap these things in and out um, is important, um, as well as another one just thought of being underpinned by a modern architecture. Lots of the companies that aren't you know, pretty much anyone that's not sort of already established big tier one bank probably has ambition to 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 scale and that may go up and down. So the, the architecture that's underpinning this needs to be scalable um, again to keep it only being costly for the right reasons in the right moment um, when that demand is high um, right. and then in terms of the regions we've obviously just heard about open banking data the uk of course is um has a lot more sort of acceptance on the consumer side of open banking data which is a really great um great step forward to be able to uh, to buy into that as consumers and organizations and use that data but th for the rest of europe which is is not is not quite there again we get in discussions all the time about how to use alternative data sources to find another way to simulate that that potential um, sort of risk assessment and understand what's there with quite creative sources. Um, and that's, I guess, linked to the underbanked bit we talked about earlier. So, yeah, data is absolutely fundamental to everything we're talking about. You can't make any decision without the right data. Right, right. So let's roll. I want to turn to you and talking about this um, this open banking data. I mean, you've touched on it, but I want to talk around, um, you know, you, you guys are doing interesting things around uh, open banking data with around cash flow and risk. Maybe you can just describe in more detail your approach there. I think um, <clears throat> I think let me take a step back, right, in terms of open banking data, right? I mean the way the way we see it is, you know, essentially it's transaction data, right? Now uh, that transaction data, right, for us is helpful because we've got business current accounts, right, which means you know we have internal data or our own customers. Which is the transaction data, you know, which kind of helps us helps us create um, create you know models slash strategies using that data internally and seeing the performance of that data, right? I think that's you know that's that's probably you know I think the biggest challenge in open banking data, right? To be able to kind of gain critical mass on that data, to be able to kind of create strategies slash models out of that data, right? So at least when you have when you have a current account product in place, right, you can use that use that proprietary data, right, to kind of build some of the strategies. Now, we didn't really start, you know, kind of uh, uh, start, you know, on, on the consumer side, right, on the open banking side, but more on the business side, right, in terms of saying, um, how is it that, you know, that transaction data can help our customers understand um, what they are likely to need in the next month, month and a half, three months, and so on and so forth. So it was not predicting about risk, right, in, in the first instance. It was more about predicting their need. So essentially what you do is, right, you kind of use that transaction data and you uh, and you run it through, you know, a, a machine learning model, right, in the sense that uh, how are their transactions, right, across the last 12 months? And, you know, what are the payments that are likely to come up, right, in the next, you know, whatever, three, six months? And given their, you know, given their balance at this time and the trajectories that we have seen in the past, right, are they likely to meet those payments or not, right? So is there a need, for example, you know, for example, you know, there's there's a payment coming up, but that cash flow probably wouldn't let them, um, let them, you know, be allowed to make that payment, right? Which means there's probably a need for lending. Or a second aspect, right, is for example, seasonality, right? Most businesses in the UK are, are seasonal in nature, right? I mean, there'll be up, you know, peaks and troughs, right? Depending on when the demand is, right? And, you know, when they will need to buy raw materials and so on and so forth. So, you know, you'd see a chunk of transactions um, coming in, right, in terms of saying, you know, these are the new buys at a particular time in the year. 
So if somebody probably needs, let's say, for example, working capital at that point in time um, for, you know, buying raw materials, then that's another prediction in terms of saying, OK, you know, you, you probably don't have to make a payment, but you need to stock up, right, for um, for for your your peak season, right? And I think that's where that's where that transaction data really helps, right? In terms of saying, you know, how is it that we can make their life easier by predicting, saying, you know, whether whether you have enough money, and if not, right? How is it that that we can step in and we can help? Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, you know, then the next extension really is about saying, you know, can I use that open banking data in risk assessment, right? You know, which is again transaction data, right? And you know, it's it's pretty common, right, in that sense. For example, you know, if you'd see gambling transactions in 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 in, in a current account data, you're, you're naturally high risk, right? I mean, at least the data says so. Um, so you know, in in that sense, you know, it's high risk. Um, or you know, if if you have missed three direct debit payments in the last three months, I know you know that that's another high risk indicator, right? So you know, there are there are ways um, where we have used that data, right, um, to be able to kind of you know help us help our customers, right, to get what they need, and then at the same time making sure that what they what they um, uh, what they take, right, from a lending perspective, is still affordable for them to repay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay, so I want to I want to still touching on open banking data, data, but Josh, I want to turn to you and talk about financial health because I know Zopa's um, created some tools um, using open banking data to help borrowers or or customers, any of your customers, um, understand their financial health better. Can you just uh, can you talk about the innovation that you that you created there? So. Yeah, as you said, we, we've launched a number of different tools, actually. Most recently, um, a tool that uses open banking to be able to make payments on behalf of customers and move money around. Prior to that, very much insights with open banking data, and we have a debt consolidation calculator as well as our borrowing power tool. So we have this suite of insight tools using more traditional credit data in some situations, uh, the borrowing power tool, in uh, open banking data in the insights tool and then kind of merging them together with um with things like the debt consolidation calculator um we're seeing quite good um traction actually on it so we've had about 53,000 customers sign up to use uh, the open banking insights and it's very much like helping customers manage their financial lives so um, we have various prompts around kind of recurring bills, helping people realize, oh, should you be setting up recurring, recurring payments to pay that bill that you always seem to pay manually at roughly the same time every month? Um, we also have kind of like um, flags for price increases. So when we know that there are price increases coming or if we see that actually they've had a regular repayment of I know, 20 pounds, for example, it's now increased to 23 pounds or so, prompting the customer saying, did you realize this? Like, should you be doing something about it? Um, kind of thing. So starting to just raise all of this up to customers. Um, I mean, you'll have probably seen in the uh, media around the number of people with uh, Netflix subscriptions that kind of aren't really using them. They kind of tick up in price every so often. Uh, It's really kind of making sure that people are actively thinking about this and saving themselves money. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're very much focused on that. We also use it for the debt consolidation calculator. So this is where we use a combination of open banking data and credit data to help people save money on their uh, finances. So we use um, we use the data to be able to work out or give a pretty solid guesstimate of the uh, rate that somebody is paying on their lending either by using kind of the credit card data in open banking or the credit file data for a loan. With that, we're then able to present the customer a number of options with what Zopa could offer. And therefore, could that reduce their um, total cost of credit? Could it reduce their monthly repayments? Like, what does this mean for them? And then just give them the options, put it in front of them in a really clear, understandable way uh, so that the customer can make a really good informed choice. Um, Our plan then in the future is to use uh, a combination of open banking and hopefully when we get to it, open finance, although I'm aware that that's many years away, um, to be able to then do that for the customer. Like, can we then take the loan, pay off all of the accounts, et cetera? Is this something where we can really 
step in and say to the customer, you're paying X, you could be paying Y, we'll do the rest for you. Um, is that something that really benefit them? Interesting, interesting. Okay, we're, we're going to get to a couple of audience questions, but maybe before we do, uh, we haven't talked about KYC and fraud yet. So, um, Carol, maybe I could turn to you and talk about, you know, when, you know, what are the innovations that you're seeing um, when it comes to KYC and catching catching the fraudsters for consumer lenders? You're on mute, you're on mute, Carol. Um, I think the world's emerging. So, um still in some organizations but perhaps less so as a general theme um all these sort of aspects of risk um are actually starting to now come together so what i mean by that is if you're trying to assess you know peter and and the risk of him you could be suspicious because of a number of things either you fail your kyc i you might be sort of a known terrorist on the list out there or you're a fraudster because you match to something suspicious either through your your sort of your mobile and uh, data or your your email address or something like that um, or you just perhaps are, um, not suspicious, but a risk because you can't afford a product, you, you don't have the right background um, or, um, you know, the, the bureau data doesn't stack up. So I guess where we're seeing um, sort of the, the trend of, of using this sort of data, it's holistically um, as part of an overall risk assessment. And again, thinking back to what we were saying about calling data and the cost of that. If you're trying to call all sorts of data about fraud and the compliance piece and the credit bit as well in one journey for every single customer, that's going to get expensive. But mm -hmm. actually trying to look at it holistically and think, well, is there a sensible order for us as an organization that makes sense to call this in? And it and it does vary um, for a number of reasons, but it is a journey and it and it's a process. So if for some reason, you know, that that potential customer is suspicious along the way for something else, there's no need to actually um, actually address these other sources. So that's sort of one thing around the data. And then the second and final thing is around um, these as themes. Again, with fraud and compliance, um, which is where I started sort of 20 years ago, fraud was all about stopping losses. It was about, you know, trying to stop bad, shut the door on everyone. I used to work for a big bank and new accounts wanted to open the door for everyone and fraud teams wanted to shut the door for everyone. And it was this sort of big, you know, this big uh, sort of game between the, the two. Whereas actually now, similar to what I was saying earlier, I think it's seen as a potential um, growth enabler because if you're really good at your fraud detection and sort of your regulatory compliance piece, again, it means you really understand who you're doing business with, who you're interacting with, and then you can serve them. You've got to be able to action it as well. You can serve them in a really appropriate way, which you know can get great customers flying through the door, or it could shut the door very quickly, just to build on the analogy for those that present a sort of risk. So yes, increase in uses of data, being sort of brought together with other pieces of risk, that's what we're seeing, but then also thinking about it differently and using it as an enabler as opposed to just this sort of this thing to try and stop. Mm -hmm. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so we need to get to audience questions. Um, first one, what are some suggestions to automate consumer lending with minimal human interventions from agents to underwriters? Who wants to tackle that one? I'll I'll give it an initial go. We'll go with so um certainly so from our point of view, one of the biggest things that um causes human intervention are things like income verification and the verification checks that we do. So one of the big things that we're doing at the moment and actually about to launch is um open banking data that's being sent to us by um kind of the intermediary partners that we work with, we'll be able to process that through our income verification models live in the system. And we're actually going to be able to then say to customers who are on that particular aggregator, look, one, we've pre-approved you for that rate, that um, uh, loan amount, but also on top of that, we know that you've been verified for income verification as well. So at that point, there's going to be um, less or hopefully no um, kind of friction later on in the journey. Um, so for me, I think both Rahul and 
Carol um, touched on this um, as well. It's about getting as much data in as early in the journey as possible and therefore trying to make your decisions in an automated fashion and really trying to avoid getting to the agent. So even if that fails or if a customer comes through a different channel, we will then, if they do um, refer for income, we will ask them for the open banking data and we have an automated model that will try and do the income verification. So we'll always try and go for a semi-automated route and only go to a human if absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, next question here. What do you see as most innovative and profitable business models within the card-based BNPL space? Anyone? <laughs> I'm hoping Rahul might be able to take this one because I'll be honest, it's not <laughs> I, an area I that say, we're I in. From any profitable models. I, 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 I mean, I, I do think, right, every... Every model has its own um, has its own benefit, and there are you know there are various ways of doing it, right? So, for example, you know, on a BNPL side, and I'm sure Josh has already seen it, is um, is you know kind of saying you know a single transaction, um, single you know single transaction lending versus a line lending, and then letting you know kind of let them run through those, or something you know which we are doing, kind of saying uh, you know that that here is you know however you want to use it, right? So you know, there are there are various models out there. I think eventually any profitability, and this is not related to BNPL is my thought, right? Any, any profitability, right, with a business is where the relationship with the customer is pretty deep, right? In the sense that, you know, it's a long-term relationship. It's not transactional in nature, right? So where a business model essentially um, kind of helps the customer, right, you know, achieve their financial objectives in a long-term fashion, I think that's where the business model, right, which is which is profitable, right? So in a BNPL environment, I would probably see something as saying, here's a customer, here's a line, right, which is what you have. And then how you use your line across multiple merchants, multiple platforms um, is for the customer to decide, right? And that's what kind of, you know, keeps the business ticking, right? That's, at least that's my thought on that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I want to close with um, a forward-looking question. And... Um, maybe Carol, I'll, I'll, I'll lob this one to you to close out the, the, the webinar here. What are some of the, the key industry trends that, that will define consumer lending over the next 12 months, do you think? Um, well, I think we will, we know some of those now, and I still think those that are innovating and disrupting will, will continue to push and, and try new things. Um, I think, you know, we've we've talked around this a lot today. I think innovation around the engagement with consumers is just more um, necessary than ever um, to deliver value to that consumer and thus achieve, you know, value for, for organisations themselves. So I think that that engagement piece is, is really important. And then I think the flexibility of the products, you know, Rahul was mentioning around, you know, terms of different products and the flexibility there. Josh was talking about, again, the variety of things and portfolios and sort of the offering of financial services being broad to, to have that relationship quite sticky. And with the consumer, I think I think they're both they're both really sort of um, great examples of where the product flexibility will will continue to to be an important theme because you know everyone's sort of fighting for that for that business and that space. So yeah, I think I'd wrap up with those two. And then perhaps the final one is around the tech itself, and and as we've heard the the evolution of both data and how it's used uh, and then the AI piece as well being embedded and, and part of the norm. Okay, we'll, we'll have to leave it there, Carol. That was a super interesting, um, great way to end. Thank you very much uh, to our speakers, um, Josh, Rahul and Carol. Thanks, of course, again to Provenir for making this all possible. And thank you to um, all of the viewers for, for tuning in. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks.